Well, today, um, this week for sure is a big week for our country. We got a big election coming up, and uh, there were a few people asking, you know, are you preaching on the election? And I said, no, I think I'll, I'll stick to the Bible. Um, but, uh, but as a shepherd, I do want to encourage all of us. I heard a stat that um, was really alarming to me from the Barna Research Group, and they had uh, shown that there was 104 million Christians who were saying that they were not going to vote in this year's election. And so today, I will, I will never tell you uh, who to vote for. That's not my role as your shepherd, as your pastor. Uh, but I do want to encourage you to vote. Uh, we live in a uh, democracy, a republic, and it's a, it's a privilege to be able to vote and to uh, share our influence uh, through a vote. And so I really want to encourage you not to be like those 104 million people. Um, elections are a big deal. Uh, and so we want to uh, share our voice uh, because Jordan Easley said this. He said, when Christians are silent, then Christian values become stagnant. And so, church, I just want you to uh, not be silent. Don't let your vote sit there uh, and, and um, not be used. Let your voice be heard in gentleness, in respect, in love. But we must share and fight for Christian values in this country or they can go away. And so I really want to encourage you to, um, here's, here's how I want to encourage you on Tuesday. If you haven't already done an early voting, I just encourage you to get before the Lord and you pray, you have an open Bible, and you say, Lord, you lead me how I should vote. And, uh, and then go from there. Uh, I will not tell you how to vote, but uh, I will tell you that in your conscience and your convictions before the Lord, uh, I encourage you to go and let your voice be heard. Because if we don't stand up for our Christian values, who will? Right? Uh, if we don't stand up for the things that the Word of God teaches, then... Satan's camp is really not going to do that, right? So we cannot be silent on these, on these issues. And I want to read one uh, section of Scripture in, um, in the book of Hebrews in regards to this. Hebrews chapter 12, uh, verses 28 and 29. It says this, the writer says, Therefore... Since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, believers, let that encourage you. That should just fire you up. That should fill you with joy that our king is going to one day come and he is going to bring about his rule and his reign. He's going to instill justice and righteousness on this planet and that kingdom cannot be shaken. It doesn't matter what happens. It doesn't matter what war, uh, what wars come. It doesn't matter what political ideologies may rise up. His kingdom cannot be shaken. And in, in, the, in the vein of that, the writer of Hebrews says, therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us be thankful. All church, let your gratitude for the Lord overflow. That the world should know that, man, we are the people of God. His kingdom cannot be shaken, and we are adopted into this family. If you are not a Jew here, if you are a Gentile here, that means you've been adopted into the family of God. We are receiving this kingdom, and that kingdom cannot be shaken. It cannot be shaken. And so, he says, let us be thankful, and so worship God acceptably with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. So listen, no matter what happens on Tuesday, Jesus is still going to rule and reign from his throne. Doesn't matter what happens on Tuesday. But that doesn't mean that we just sit back and let what happens happen, that we don't use the influence that God has given us. We don't stand up for what we believe, and we do. But at the end of the day, I've read the end of the book. I know who wins. I know that peace is coming. I know that joy is coming. And it is secure in Jesus. 
And that kingdom cannot be shaken. So I want to rest in that. Yes, I want to vote and I want to uh, uh, be engaged in our systems enough to let it, let it be known that I'm going to fight for Christian values. But there's a peace and a rest about me that no matter what happens, I know my security rests not in who is uh, in the Oval Office, but who's on the throne. And that's King Jesus. And so that's, that's what we should have as a church is just that peace. Amen. And that's what the world doesn't have. The world does not have peace and they're searching for it. And they're hoping that it can come in one political party or another. They're hoping that it can come in their bank account. They're hoping that it can come in their retirements, but only true peace. The only way you can find true peace is in Jesus. And so I, I want us to, as a church, just to pray, uh, for this election, but I really want to pray that, uh, the good news of the gospel of Jesus would shine brightly in us and through us, the people of God. So that as we have conversations in our democratic republic, as we have these engaging conversations where there are conversations that need to be had, but we can do it in love, in respect, in gentleness, that the, the lost world can see Jesus in us so that his name would be glorified and they would be put to shame for trying to bring something against us because they have nothing to bring. And so I just wanna pray for our country I want to pray that uh, we would turn to the Lord, that we would repent of our evil ways. And, and I want to be clear, uh, the, the salvation of this country is not going to be Donald Trump or Kamala Harris. Uh, neither one of them will be the saving grace for this country, but only as this country turns and repents and turns to the Lord. Uh, so that's, I just want to pray for just a moment and ask the Lord to be with us. Uh, ask for favor in this election that our values uh, may be protected, our freedoms may be protected, and that we can continue to be the people God has called us to be. Amen. So let's pray together. Father, we thank you for this great country that you have given us the, the privilege of being born into, to come into, and we're thankful for that. And we know this, this week is a, uh, it's a big week. It's election week. And uh, most likely at the, at the end of this week, we will have elected a president, a new president. So, Father, we just humbly pray that you would, uh, we know that you're sovereign over it, it all. But we pray that you would give us wisdom into how to engage in conversations in the right way so that you can be seen in us and through us as we deal with difficult subjects, that we may represent your heart well, represent your name well on the, uh, on the front of social media, on the front of at the ballot box and different conversations. So God, we're just praying that you would uh, help us lead this country back toward, toward you. So give us favor, Father. We need you. Above anything, above any agenda, above any political system, Father, we are desperate for your presence. We just need you. So as we go and vote this week, we pray for favor. We pray that as we do, the name of Jesus would be glorified and people would be drawn to him. We pray all this in the name of Jesus. And everybody said, amen. amen. Well, today, um, in the midst of this, this changing world that we are in, this culture that we are uh, seeing that is becoming more and more anti-Christian, I wanted to start a new sermon series today in the book of Titus. So if you got your Bibles, you may want to be finding Titus after 1st and 2nd Timothy. And um, the book of Titus was written by the Apostle Paul. Uh, this is one of the later letters that he wrote before his death, just a, some time before he was martyred. And it was addressed to a young man named Titus. Titus was like Timothy in the fact that uh, he traveled and served with the Apostle Paul. And now the Apostle Paul had done some ministry on the little island of Crete. It's uh, west of Cyprus. And uh, Paul did not have time to put into order the, all the churches that were started there in the homes. And so the Apostle Paul leaves this little island of Crete and he writes to young Titus and says, Titus, I need you to put, this, uh, put into order the things that were left undone, uh, to strengthen these churches, to bring in sound doctrine because... Crete was, a, was a, um, a little island that was full of chaos, full of turmoil, uh, full of sin. And uh, in, in, verse, uh, in, chapter one of, uh, in chapter 1, verse 10, I believe it's verse 10, 
Um, Paul says that there are many rebellious people full of meaningless talk and deception, especially those of the circumcision group. And then verse 12, he says, one of Crete's own prophets has said that Cretans are always liars, evil brutes, and lazy gluttons. This was the culture that Titus was ministering in. And so the apostle Paul is writing to Titus to, to encourage him in the work of changing the world in which he lived. It appears that the, the Apostle Paul had led Titus to faith because in verse 4 we see Paul addressed Titus as my true son in our common faith. Now this is not his son in the natural realm that, that Paul was Titus's dad. No, this just is his spiritual father, his father in the faith, if you will. So uh, the context of this letter is just that Paul is writing to this young man, Titus, to put things in order there on the island of Crete so that they can change that culture and bring glory to God through the churches that have been planted there. So I've, en I've entitled this, st uh, this uh, study of the book of Titus, just Titus, Changing Your World changing your world. Now, here's what I believe. I believe that we are world changers. And you know why I believe that? Because we have the Spirit of God living in us, if you are indeed a believer. As Christians, we are filled with the Spirit of God. God's Spirit lives and dwells in us as we go out and live and, 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 and work and go in our neighborhoods. As we walk and abide in Christ, it is as if Jesus is there ministering and talking to the people we engage in conversation with. So I know, because I know who Jesus was, I know the power and the potential of every one of us who are filled with the Spirit of God. I believe we can change the world. And so I, I speak to you guys in that vein, knowing that I, if you are a believer in here today, I know the power of the Spirit that's in you. And so we have to abide in Christ, let our fears and our flesh move aside and allow God to work through us as he sees fit. And so I know we can change our world. So in this vein, I thought about some inventions over the years that have changed the world. And, um, and so when you think about what inventions change the world the most, you know, you just kind of start thinking about those. And if you have some cool uh, thoughts, you know, let me know. But one of the things that I, I think really changed uh, the world the most, one of them, is the light bulb. I mean, just think about what we're doing in here. We're sitting in the light. Uh, back before the light bulb was in, invented in the early 1800s and before, they worked when it was sun out, and when the sun went down, they did not work. Why? Because it was dark. That's just what you did. Um, and so the light bulb allowed you to be able to control that environment. The light bulb definitely uh, changed the world. Electricity, uh, at, at its minimum, really did change the world. So you think about who discovered electricity? A lot of people would say Ben Franklin discovered that. Well, he, he, he did in 1752, his experiments, he didn't necessarily discover electricity or invent electricity, but his inventions did link uh, lightning to electric sparks, and that lightning was, in fact, electrical. That's what Benjamin Franklin did. That was his, um, his input. So electricity is a natural phenomenon. It cannot be invented, but harnessing that power, harnessing the power of electricity has been a pretty cool process. So to make short of it, Italian ph uh, physicist Alessandro Volta he discovered that particular chemical reactions could produce electricity, and in the 1800s, he constructed the voltaic pile, which was an early battery. This battery produced a steady stream of electric current. So he was the first person to harness electricity into a steady flow of electrical charge. Then in 1831, Michael Faraday, he created an electric generator, which solved the problem of generating electric current. So Volta said, hey, I can get this electro electrical charge and be steady. And now Faraday says, I've now got a generator that can keep that stream going. Then in 1878, the famous Thomas Edison invented the light bulb. That's how we come to see the light bulb changing our world. Can you imagine your life without the light bulb? 
I really can't. I mean, I, I don't like to. Uh, if we're traveling in different countries uh, and all of us, they, they have rolling power outages or whatnot uh, and the power shuts off, it's like, ah, oh, you go. And how many, how many of you know, when, even when the power is out here, it's just, it's just natural. You walk in the room, hey, the light's off. You flip the light switch on, right? And you're like, ah, oh, I forgot the power's off. That doesn't work anymore. Uh, I can't imagine my life without the light bulb. So the light bulb definitely changed the world, but I'm here to tell us all today that we can change the world as well. So how many of you guys brought your Bibles to church with you? If you've got your Bibles, will you hold them up? This is the Word of God, and it is life-changing. It is world-shaping. And so we want to study the Word of God every time we're together. Open them to Titus chapter 1, and we're going to be in verses 1 through 4. When you find Titus chapter 1, if you're able, I want to ask you to stand in honor of the Lord and His Word. And if you're not able, hey, keep your seat. That's okay. Uh, we're, has, we're not legalistic here, right? Titus chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. The Bible says this, Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ, to further the faith of God's elect and their knowledge of the truth that leads to godliness in the hope of eternal life, which God who does not lie. Now, you can see now what I read in verse 12, that that one of their own philosophers said that Christians are always liars, evil brutes. Paul is beginning to contrast how the world lives versus who God is. And this is what, if we're, going to be, if we're going to be change agents in the world, if we're going to change the world, we cannot look like the world. We cannot be like the world. If we're going to change the world, we have to be like God, who God is, and let his nature and his character flow out from us so that the culture comes in contact with godliness. So he says, God, who does not lie, promised before the beginning of time and which now at his appointed season, he has brought to light through the preaching entrusted to me by the command of God, our savior. To Titus, my true son in our common faith, grace and peace from God the father and Jesus Christ, our savior. Now this is a different uh, greeting that we're used to seeing in our day today. We don't start our letters today talking about us first and then we address the, the, the recipient of the letter and then our letter comes. No, we just, Go immediately to the person we're talking to, and we sign our name at the bottom. Paul's doing this a little bit different. So the first three verses are all about an introduction to who Paul is. We're going to spend a lot of time talking about that in our study today. So let's pray and ask the Lord to speak to our hearts as we engage with his word. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. It is alive. It is active. As Brother Morgan prayed over me this morning, it, this word is sharper than a double-edged sword today. We pray, Father, that you would speak to us, that your word would pierce our hearts, that you would bring life where there is death, where there is lost people, may they be found today. Where there is sinners, may they be, become saints based off of your word. Where there are saints, I pray that we are equipped to be who you've called us to be, to give us a vision for our lives that you would give to us so that we can do the things that you have already prepared for us to do to the glory of your name. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. You may be seated. So today we're going to talk about the person of Paul, the purposes of Paul, and the preaching of Paul. I've, I've alliterated it. You'd like that? It was very, very Baptist-like, right? The person of Paul, the purposes of Paul, and the preaching of Paul. So I want to first begin looking at the person of Paul as he introduces himself in this letter. Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ. So if you were going to introduce yourself and give your name, your, yourself kind of a tagline, how would you do it? We kind of have this idea in our social media bios, right? It's always interesting to look at what people write in that little short bio after their name because you have their name and then there is something about them um, that is written after them, you know, uh, maybe lover of food, uh, lover of football, uh, faith, family, and football. That's probably, that's probably a, uh, anybody got that one under their bio faith, family, and football. Um, it's a good one. You could, I mean, you could, you could try that. That's a great order right there. Faith, family, and football. Um, but it's interesting to read those little bios about people because in just that short 
amount of time, you get a glimpse into who they are. You get a glimpse into what they want you to know about them, right? So it's always interesting to me. Um, I always challenged our students when I was a student pastor because students live on social media, right? I always challenged them, you know, when, when people go to your social media pages, what does your page communicate about who you are and what you believe? A challenge for all of us, because I know you adults live on social media too. Don't talk about the kids, because I see some of y'all are on there way more than the kids, all right? Um, what does your social media page communicate about who you are and about what you believe? Here's another question. Could somebody get saved by looking at your page? Does it have the truth of God's word and the gospel on your page enough that somebody could go to your page and see that? Now, sometimes I'll be honest, uh, and I'm, I've got to get back here because I'm really on a, on a tangent here, but sometimes I see people's social media pages that, yeah, there's going to be some, some uh, uh, Bible stuff on there, but the majority of their page is so polar opposite to what the Bible is, I don't believe them. Yeah, have y'all seen, seen those people? Like in one breath, they're posting a, a nice scripture verse, and then they're cursing someone out in the next post. I, 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 so I don't believe that they believe what, what, they're, what they're posting about. And so we have to be very careful. Uh, do, do, what, 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 what would people read about you on your social media page? Um, so this little, this little uh, bio of the Apostle Paul, he says, Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ. That's what he wants to communicate about us. So what does this tell us about the Apostle Paul? First, we see his humility, a servant of God. You see, servant is the Greek word doulos, which means slave or, poor, or more properly, a bond servant. You see, in the days of Paul, a slave would enter into the service or enter into the debt of somebody so that they could repay a debt that they had incurred. Uh, how many of you guys know, and I don't, has, if anybody has done this, I'm very interested to have a conversation with you. But you know when we joke, uh, go into a restaurant, that if you forgot your money, well, I hope you go, but get, get ready to go back and wash dishes. Y'all have said that or heard that. You better be ready to wash dishes. I don't, that, I don't think that has ever actually occurred. Uh, that's never really happened. If like somebody, I can't pay my bill. Can I go wash dishes for 20 minutes? Jeezy, has anybody ever done that at Jeezburger? I don't think that's ever happened, but we say it a lot, right? And so what, what that means is I have a debt that I cannot pay, and I need to enter into your service in order to pay back the debt. This is what we're talking about here. And so in Paul's day, uh, that if you had a debt you could not pay, you would go and become a slave, become a servant of that person until your debt was paid. This is the context of this word slave. Now, if after the debt was paid, the person is like, you know, I'm just looking at my life. You know, I, I have come to live with this family, uh, to pay back this debt that I owed. And as I look at my life, man, I'm more joyful I have, I have everything that I need. I, I have grown to love this family. I've grown to love my master. And, you know, I, I don't want to leave. I, I so love this. I want to stay. Listen to Deuteronomy chapter 15, verses 16 and 17. So remember, let's, let's zoom out on the, the grand narrative of Scripture. The people of God were enslaved in Egypt. They were slaves, not this, this sort of slave that I'm describing. They were slaved against their own will. And they were put under harsh working conditions. And God delivered them. He brought them out of Egypt in power and demonstration of who he is. And so then they cross through the Red Sea. We walk through that in the book of Exodus. They, they enter into the promised land, uh, or they're about to in Deuteronomy. And so God is creating a people that were not meant to be slaves. They were meant to serve him. They were not meant to be slaves of people. But as, the, as history would, would go, God understood this culture. And he said, there's going to be people that are going to have debts that they need to pay back. And so they're going to enter into service. And so what he does is he begins to uh, uh, put in laws in, his, in the old covenant that say, if you've got a slave, seventh year, they go free. And oh, by the way, the, the, the master is going to make sure they have everything that they need. 
Because in my economy, in God's economy, he says, I'm not going to allow slaves to become a part of who you are. That is anti-God. So don't ever accept the narrative in, in the world that says, oh, Christianity is great with slavery. Because No, God, and when he is putting this new people out, he says, slavery is not who we are. So if you have a debt you need to work off the seventh year, you go free. But then watch this in Deuteronomy chapter 15, verses 16 and 17. He says, but if your servant says to you, I do not want to leave you because he loves you and your family and is well off with you, then take an awl, I'm assuming that's a, a, a hammer, right, an A-W-L, and push it through, that's actually a nail, excuse me, take a nail and push it through his earlobe into the door and he will become your servant for life. Now that's a weird ceremony, right? Uh, I mean, you just have, have like, hey, I, I just want to work. I want to, I want to be a part of your family. I want to be your doulos. I want to be your servant for life. Okay, well, let's let's go out here and we'll take a nail and we'll pierce your ear uh, into the doorpost. That's that's weird. So what's the big deal about the nail going through the ear? What's the significance about this ceremony? Well, just for a moment, think about some of the things we're talking about. Nails through the flesh. What does that remind you of? The gospel. That reminds me of the crucifixion of Jesus. Blood on the doorpost. What does that remind you of as we studied the book of Exodus? That there is only deliverance through the blood. The blood of Jesus is the only way that we can truly be saved. So when the children of Israel were in bondage, enslavement, enslaved in Egypt, God said, I will deliver you by the Passover angel, but I will only pass over the houses where I see the blood on the doorpost. Blood on the doorpost. And then a scar, a hole in, in the flesh that is a symbol that you belong to someone else. Jesus had scars in his hands. He's going to be the only one, as Casting Crown Song says, he's the only one with scars in heaven. He's the only one. And it's a reminder, I belong to someone else. That's what baptism is. And that's what Matthew and Olivia uh, walk through. Your baptism just is a proclamation to the world. I belong to Jesus now. And that's why we do, we, we are to be baptized by immersion and after salvation. It's a proclamation that I belong to Jesus now. It's what it is. So listen, I don't want to serve the Lord out of duty, that I have to do this. No, I want to be a doulos. I want to serve the Lord out of delight because I love him. I know what he has done for me, and I want to give my life to serve him because it is the delight of my heart to do that, not, not because I'm supposed to do that. So I always encourage you, evaluate why you're here. Evaluate why you came to church today. What is, the, what is the heart behind your coming to church today? Are you coming to church today because that's what you're supposed to do because it's a Sunday morning? Or do you come into the room with a sense of expectation? I'm excited to see what God does in his house today. I'm excited to grow in my knowledge of the word, to be sharpened by my brothers and sisters in Christ. What drives your attendance today? I pray that you come here today out of delight and not out of duty. So we see the Apostle Paul's humility that this guy who wrote most of the New, the New Testament, this guy that is, as we're going to see, uh, an apostle of Jesus Christ, he saw the Lord Jesus face to face. The first thing he tells us about him is, I'm just a servant of Jesus Christ. That's who I am. I'm a doulos. That's who I am. So we see his humility, but secondly, we see his authority. Apostle of Jesus Christ, that's who he is. The apostle was, on the other hand, not a, just a title of great humility. An apostle was a title of great authority. You see, the apostle was a name given to specifically the 12 that were with Jesus and as one unusually born, the apostle Paul, because he saw Jesus face to face post-resurrection. So Paul had been with Jesus. He had been commissioned by the Lord Jesus himself. And so his words carried great weight. So this is the Apostle Paul. Come, he can come in with great authority and great power, but he comes in in, in humility saying, I'm just a servant of Jesus. But take my words seriously 
because I am an apostle commissioned by the Lord Jesus himself. So that's the person of Paul. Secondly, we see the purposes of Paul. Look at the second part of uh, verse 1. He is a, an apostle uh, of Jesus Christ, a servant of God, an apostle of Christ, to further the faith of God's elect and their knowledge of the truth that leads to godliness. So he has two purposes here, two purposes and one result. The purpose to further the faith of God's elect and the purpose to increase their knowledge of the truth and the result leading to godliness. So his first purpose was to help the church's faith, to help the church's faith. This is where we must begin, church. We are saved by grace through faith. We are not saved by works. And so he's trying to help the church increase their faith. I love what Kent Hughes wrote. He said, those who believe are God's elect, meaning their eternal status is determined by the love of a heavenly heart and not by the work of human hands. I don't know if you know that, but that's really good news. Your salvation is not dependent on what you do. Your salvation is dependent on what Jesus has done. And that frees us so much. It is by faith that we are saved, not by works. But watch this. The faith that does save you is going to be accompanied by works. It will be accompanied by works. Listen to what James says in James chapter 2, verses 17 through 19. James, the half-brother of Jesus, says this. In the same way, faith by itself if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith and I have deeds. But then James says, show me your faith without deeds and I will show you my faith by my deeds. He says, you believe that there is one God? Good. Even the demons believe that and they shudder. The demons who are opposed to God in every way, they have a great fear of of God and who he is. So think about faith for just a moment. Faith is just not mental assent. Faith is not saying, do you believe in Jesus? Yes, I believe in Jesus. Do you believe that he was uh, sent from God as the son of God? Yes, I believe it. Do you believe he lived a perfect and sinless life, that he died on the cross bearing the, the, the weight and the punishment for all sin? Do you believe that he was buried in a borrowed tomb and then three days later, Jesus rose again from the grave victorious over sin, death, hell, and Satan? Do you believe that? Absolutely, I believe that. James is saying, Satan does too. He believes that. So this is not a mental assent belief that, yes, I believe this. I believe this stage is going to hold me up. It's more than that. It is, faith is a volition. It is a, a surrender of the will that, yes, I believe in, in Jesus. And now he's not just Savior. I'm making him Lord of my life, that what he says, that's what I'm going to do. And so this is where the Apostle Paul was challenging Titus in this, in this culture that was opposed to God. I want to help the, the faith of the church. It's one thing for you to say that you believe that the, church, the, the chair around you will hold you up. I believe that if I was to sit in this, this seat on the front row, it will hold me up. But it would be something totally different if I never sat in it, right? Do you? We just sang it. I trust in God, my Savior. I cried out to him. I called on him. And he heard and he answered. That's why I trust him. Do you have those testimonies in your life that you call on the name of the Lord? When, you're, when, when, when things go bad, where, where do you turn first? When your life gets flipped upside down, do you, do you run to your own devices, your own wisdom, or do you run to Jesus? Do you have, is there enough evidence in your life to show that you trust in God, that your faith is in him, not in yourself? Do you have that? So the purpose of Paul is to increase the faith of the church. Later, Hughes wrote this, godly conduct itself does not lead to a relationship with God. But watch this. Rather, the relationship with God that gospel faith establishes leads to righteous actions. We are not saved by works, but the faith that saves us will be accompanied by righteous deeds, righteous works. So what exactly is faith? I want you to think about this for just a moment. What is faith? If you're describing it to somebody, how would you describe it? Well, I have no greater definition than what the Bible says. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1 says, Now faith is confidence in what we hope for 
and assurance about what we do not see. Faith is confidence. The things that I have never laid my eyes on the Lord Jesus, but I have faith, I have confidence that one day that eastern sky is going to part and he's going to call us home, or one day I'm going to breathe my last breath on this earth and I'm going to breathe my first breath in the presence of my Savior and I'm going to look at him with my eyes and we're going to be face to face. I have confidence in that. I have assurance in that. And the way that I live my life shows that I have that confidence and assurance. Faith is confidence. Faith is assurance. Confidence in what we hope for. Assurance of what we do not see. So here's a question for us today. Are you growing in your faith? Are you, are you growing in your trust of the Lord Jesus? Or are you still trying to hold on to your life as much as you can? Put it, put it another way. Are you growing in your confidence of God? It's just, it's something different when you're praying and asking God for something. Our family is praying and asking God to intervene in our family's life for our aunt who is fighting for her life. We're praying and asking God to intervene and heal her miraculously. And there is confidence and there is assurance that God can do that. I absolutely know the God who spoke this universe into existence can touch her body and bring her back to health instantly. I believe he can do that. But I have assurance that God is a good, good father. Regardless of the outcome of this situation, it does not tell me whether God is good or not. I know he is perfectly good. And I know that if he chooses to do something I'm, I don't necessarily want, that I can still praise him because the story he's going to write is going to be for our good and for his glory. That's the assurance and the confidence that we have. So are you growing in your faith? So here's a question, though. How do you grow in your faith? Well, you grow in your faith by increasing your knowledge of the truth. And that's the second purpose of Paul, to help the church's knowledge of the truth. Listen, church, we must grow in our relationship and our knowledge of the Bible. We must grow. So I'm not sure where you are today uh, in, in terms of the, the, uh, the level of your knowledge of the scriptures, what I would encourage you to do is just be honest. Be honest about where you are in your knowledge of the scripture to say, you know what, this is about how much I know. And whatever that is, grow. Doesn't matter if you're like, man, I have never, I've, I've had a Bible my entire life. I've always had a Bible. And anytime I sit in church like you're doing now, I have the Bible open or I open it up on my phone. But I have never one time sat down before the Lord in my own time and opened the Bible and said, Lord, I, I want you to speak to me. I want to learn the, the, the scriptures. I want to learn them. I'm going to study them. I have never done that. If that's who you are, that's okay. Start today to say, Lord, I want to increase in my knowledge. If you're somebody that's like, you know what? I have been studying the Bible for 60 years. Uh, I have memorized a large portion of it. I can tell you all, I can tell you a little summary about every single book about the Bible. I've, I, I know a lot about the Bible. What I would encourage you is grow in your knowledge of the scriptures because we're, we're never going to, to be sufficient in our knowledge, right? We will never be there for all eternity. For all eternity, we are still going to be mining the depths of God's word, understanding more and more about his nature and his character and his goodness and his grace. And every time that we find a new nugget of God's wisdom, it's going to lead us to praise. And we're going to worship him for how good he is. And then we're going to go and mine the depths even more and say, I want to know God more and I want to know him more. And then when we find something else new, it's going to lead us to worship. We're going to do that for all eternity. And it it is going to be amazing. So Paul is here to help the church's knowledge of the truth. I love what Peter says as he signs off the, the pages of scripture the, in, this, in 2 Peter, the last book that he wrote, chapter 3, verse 18, the apostle Peter, the leader of the 12 disciples that was with Jesus. I love the apostle Peter. Me, I, have, I find myself so much aligning to what, who he is and the things that he does. I talk a whole lot. I put my foot in my mouth way too much. I'm, I'm strong-willed. I find so much of myself in the apostle Peter. But as he, as he finishes his uh, writings in the New Testament, he says this, but grow. He's, he's, he's finishing his writing to the church, and the last thing he wants to tell the church is grow. Grow in the grace and the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's what we want to do. 
That's what I want to encourage you to do, to grow in, your, in the grace of God and grow in your knowledge of the truth. And then what's the result? As, we, as, as our, our faith is increased, as our knowledge of the truth, and by the way, this is the truth. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. God's word is a revelation of who he is, and Jesus is God. And so this is a revelation of who God is. Therefore, this is the truth. So if we want to we grow in the, tr- in the knowledge of the truth, we're going to have to n- grow in our knowledge of the Bible. What will be the result that leads to godliness? See, holiness and Christ-likeness are the, the goal, in, is the end goal of our knowledge. We don't just uh, uh, learn and grow in our knowledge so that we can be puffed up. You, you, have you ever met people like that? They just want to throw their degrees at you and say, I don't know if you know this, but I'm smarter than you are. Just, I, just, I, I know that. I just want to make sure you know that. Um, that puffs up, and that's not who God is. Our knowledge, the end goal of our knowledge is Christ-likeness. We want to be more like Jesus. That's what the end goal of it is. So that that leads to godliness. John Stott wrote this, any doctrine which does not promote godliness is manifestly bogus. It's just foolish. If if the doctrine that you are believing does not lead you to godliness, it's, it's bogus. So how are we to grow in our godliness? Watch this. It will be as we grow in our faith and our knowledge. You see, faith and knowledge are not polar opposites. They're not polar opposites. They go hand in hand. Our faith is not based on our feelings or our desires, but our faith is based on the facts of the word of God. Don't think that faith, that we're just here, that we're, we're pushing this faith and it's like, you know, hey, name it and claim it, baby. I'm really believing that when I get home, there's going to be a check for $10,000 or there's going to be a new Ford F-150 sitting in my driveway. I'm just believing that. That's ridiculous. Call it what it is. That's crazy. And there, there is a sect of people in, uh, that claim Christianity that is, is about the prosperity gospel, that you should be prospering as the people of God. And if you name it, you can claim it and you believe it and you walk in it. That's crazy. Our faith is not based on a feeling or I just really want this and I believe God, if he loves me, he's really going to give this to me. That's crazy. Our faith is based on the facts of the word of God. And if God says it, he will do it. So that's why we have the joy of, of, of looking in the scripture saying, God, I, I want to I know this. I want to know you more. And if you give me a promise, then I'm taking it to the bank because you said it and I know you will do it. Which is why, as the people of God, we're looking forward to the hope of the resurrection, that one day Jesus is going to come back, he's going to call the church home, and, and, then, and then there's going to be a time of tribulation, and then Jesus is going to reign on this earth for a thousand years, and then the new Jerusalem after that is going to come down, and God is going to dwell with his people forever. That time is coming. That's our hope. That's, and and it, is, it is as good as done, because God does not lie, and he said that's coming. All the prophecies that he has said in the Old Testament that have already come true, just go study them. And you say, here's a prophecy. God said this. He did it. God said this. He did it. You will never find, not one time, a time where God said, I will do this, and he did not do it. He always comes through. He always comes through. So our faith is based on the facts of the scripture. John Stott wrote this. It is those who know God's name who put their trust in him. Their knowledge of God's name or their knowledge of his revealed character that they find in his word is the foundation of their faith in him. They trust him because they know that he is trustworthy. Psalm chapter 34, verse 8, taste and see that the Lord is good. Does anybody here today just want to raise their hand and say, I I have tasted and I have seen and I'm good to testify that he is good and he is worthy of your pursuit. He's worthy of your devotion. He's worthy of your admiration. That's who God is. And listen, if we are going to change the world around us, it will be as we grow in our faith, as we grow in our knowledge of scripture that will promote godliness. And as we live And the overflow of a relationship with Jesus, his grace empowering us to do what we're called to do, then we can change the world. Then we can change the world. So that's the purposes of Paul. 
And finally, we have the preaching of Paul. Look at verses two and three. In the hope of eternal life. So we're increasing our faith, we're increasing our knowledge of the truth that leads to godliness. All of that in the hope of eternal life which God, who does not lie, promised before the beginning of time, and which now at his appointed season he has brought to light through the preaching entrusted to me by the command of God our Savior. Paul preached in such a way that the faith and the knowledge of the truth of his people would increase, resulting in godliness, all the while resting in the hope of eternal life that is secure in God's promises. Eternal life, that, that, that future life is not here yet but it's secure in God's promises. And Paul's saying, God does not lie. And so it is secure. John Stott, again, he, he wrote this. If we're called to leadership in the church, we should have the same vision, the same ambition, namely to cultivate in the people of God committed to our care, the faith which lays hold of God and of his Christ, the knowledge of truth which issues in godliness, and the hope of eternal life which, though still future, has been promised and guaranteed by God. God does not lie. If he says it, he will do it. God promised eternal life before the beginning of time. So I want you to think about this for just a moment. The hope and confidence in eternal life, and confidence in the, in the eternal life extends into the inf infinite future and into the past to the beginning of time. The promise of eternal life extends into the infinite future and it extends into the past to the beginning of time. So what does that mean for us today? You cannot outrun God's infinite grace. You cannot outrun it. Think about this. Before you ever sinned, grace. And after you take your last breath on this earth, grace. Does that, does that comfort you? So if you're here today and you're like, there's no way God could love me. And I promise you, if you're not thinking this, there's people that you're going to come in contact with. If, if, if this thought is running through there. There's no way that God could love me because of what I've done. There's no possible way. I'm here to tell you today that before the world began, God's grace was there. And his plan of redemption was in place. God knew who you were going to be. He knew what you were going to do. And he, then G, he sent Jesus to die for you anyway. You cannot outrun God's grace. This is the good news that we, the church, get to share. And it's the most incredible news in the world. that We can tell no matter what you've done. People, I don't care where you are. I don't care the things that you've done. I'm telling you, you cannot outrun the grace of God. And this is the message that we get to share. Why would we not share it? God's infinite grace. Ephesians chapter one, verses three through five. Paul writes this, praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love, he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will. We get to praise the God who would love us that much. And then we'll finish it up. Titus chapter one, verse four, Paul says to Titus, my true son in our common faith. Now that we, we, we kind of just read over that, but here's what I want you to understand. Titus was a Gentile. Titus was a Gentile. He was not a Jew. And in that day, there was great uh, fighting and arguments between the Jews and the Gentiles. The Jews had, many Jews had problems with the fact that the Gentiles were being saved and counted as part of the family of God because they weren't the people of God. The Jews are. But God, in his goodness and grace, has extended to the Gentiles his love and the ability to become part of their family. And so for the Apostle Paul, in unity, to tell Titus, you are my true son in our common faith. He's promoting unity, not division. So here's what I want us to know. The gospel unites. Never allow the enemy to use you to bring division. Always allow God to use you to promote unity. This is what we see in this one statement to Titus, my true son in our common faith. Brian Chapel wrote this. Competition for recognition and regard, it fades in the realization that all the rewards of grace are unearned. 
We become equal members of the fellowship of those whose condition is desperate apart from Christ. And this humbling realization is the foundation of Christian harmony. We should be united. We should not have divisions among us because we have nothing good to say about ourselves and we have all the praise to give to Jesus. It is on that basis alone that everything that we have in Christ is unearned. That's the basis of Christian harmony. And then Paul says to Titus, grace and peace. Grace and peace. Kent Hughes wrote this, when people become absolutely convinced that their standing before God is based entirely on his grace and not on any goodness in themselves, then peace comes. Grace and peace. If you've experienced the grace of God, if you've experienced the love of God poured out for you on the cross of Christ so that you can be redeemed, then you know true peace. I'm going to ask Brother Ben to come. Our invitation is simple. Do you have peace with God? If you do, let it drive you to worship. Have you experienced the grace of God? Romans chapter 5, verse 1. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, and that's how you're justified. Justified is a Bible word that means just as if I'd never sinned. That's justification. When Jesus saves us, it is just like we had never, ever sinned in our life. We are made whole and pure and clean, and that is the good news of Jesus. So he says, therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Do you have peace with God today? Do you know that you've experienced the grace of God and you have that relationship with God? And it is evidenced in your sanctification. Your faith is now made manifest in your life by the, by the changed life, by how you live. You don't live like you used to live. And that is evidence that you have been changed. And that is the confidence that you can have, that you now have peace with God. Do you have that peace? If you do, I pray that out of the overflow of your relationship with the Lord, you would promote unity in the church, that you would point people to Jesus because they can have that peace too. So if you're here today and you don't know Jesus, come to Jesus. He died for you. He loves you so much. He has a plan and a purpose for your life to bring him honor and glory. And you begin that journey by repenting of your sin and putting your faith in the finished work of the cross of Christ. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Is there anybody here today that says, Pastor, I don't know Jesus. I'm very religious. I have been in church for a long time, but I have no relationship. And the truth be told, when I lay my head on my pillow at night, I have no peace. If you're here today and you want that peace and you say, I need to trust in Jesus today, would you just raise your hand? I'd like to pray for you. Just raise your hand. I need peace in my life. I've never been saved before and I want to be saved today. Would you just raise your hand? I don't want to miss anybody. Anybody need to be saved in the room today? Amen. Amen. I see you. Amen. Anybody else? Well, if you raise your hand, I want you to look up here at me. Everybody else, just keep your head bowed. I'm proud of you. And I want you to know Jesus loves you. And you can be saved today. So in just a moment, there's going to be men and women here that would love to pray with you or even after the service. I know being in the middle of the road, that's difficult. But after the service, come find me, come find one of our leaders. And just tell them this, I want to know peace. I want to know Jesus. And we will work with you today. Amen. I'm proud of you. For anybody else, you surrender to Jesus and peace comes. Father, I thank you for your love for us. We are so undeserving. So God, I pray that you would just continue to move in this place for somebody who doesn't know you. But for those of us who do know you, Father, help us grow in our faith. Help us grow in our knowledge of the truth, our knowledge about who you are, so that our lives can look more like Jesus. We pray this in his name. Amen. Would you stand as we sing?